Hey, this is Kevin Hill, and today I'm going to give you a fairly succinct or shortened version of the HADR module that I teach during my eight hour uh, DBA Fundamentals pre con. There are a number of high availability and disaster recovery options in SQL Server, depending on the version and edition, and people get very confused over what is what. Uh, they use the terms interchangeably. They use terms that aren't even that don't even apply. And I'm hoping to clear some of this up for you. This is going to be longer than one of my normal videos. Thanks for stopping by the channel. Uh, feel free to bookmark this one so you can refer back to it. And I'm going to put some some uh, minute links in the comments so you'll be able to find out. You know, if you need to know more, more about availability groups, you can just go straight to it. Uh, there's all my contact information on the screen. Uh, feel free to stalk me on Twitter. As always, I appreciate that. And let's jump right in. Okay, got some goals for this video. The primary one that so many people get wrong, and they get it wrong because they use it together. There's a difference between high availability and disaster recovery. So we want to go over that. I want you to know which options ship with Microsoft SQL Server. So maybe you're th you know, somebody's talking to you about Oracle. Not That doesn't carry over to SQL Server necessarily, or at least not in the same terms. I need you to understand what each one of them does and does not do, and that's really important what the different editions of SQL Server support, because Enterprise and Standard are very different. You pay a lot more money for Enterprise, but you get a lot more cool toys with it. And I want you to be able to at least high level, over, high level overview explain this to a coworker or a manager that is not a SQL Server person. All right, why do we care? Because your stuff is going to go offline. Your servers will die. It's just the nature of things. I don't even care if it's a cloud server. Occasionally something bad will happen and you need to be ready for that. Because if you're a DBA, it's your job to protect the data, secure it, and make it available. That is, that is DBA 101. Everything else you do is extra on top of that. Hard servers die. Disks die. Motherboards go out. Again, the cloud has mitigated a lot of that, but there's still problems that you need to be able to account for. That's why things like Azure have availability sets and, uh, and different zones that you can ship to and things like that. And fundamental truth of being a DBA, I don't care how many backups you've done. If you've never done a test restore, you're barely a DBA because that's going to bite you. And that can be a career limiting move for a resume generating event. Test your backups. Make sure you can restore them. If you're doing backups onto a bad hard drive and you can't restore them, everybody's going to point the finger at you when the server, when it goes down and you can't bring it back up. Just fact of life. Your customers expect that data is always going to be available. Uh, zero downtime, zero data loss. We all know that sounds completely unreasonable, but you actually expect the exact same thing. You go to Facebook or you go to Twitter or you go to your online banking, your expectation is that your data is right there, it's available, and fairly quickly. You'll tolerate a little bit of web lag, but you won't tolerate somebody missing your last paycheck and that's no longer in your bank because they had a DR situation. So the expectation is there. So our job is to get as close as possible to zero data loss, zero downtime. High availability. This is the definition stuff. You've got to understand this as a DBA, a manager, anybody in tech. High availability is that downtime problem. If something goes down, I want it back up as quickly as possible. And as a company, your firm should be dictating what the RTO objectives are. The less downtime you can have, the more expensive the solution. That's just the way things are. The flip side of it is the DR, which is how much data loss can I tolerate? It's a disaster if a bank loses a day of information. That can kill the entire bank in their, their reputation, financial obligations, everything else. If you lose one minute, that one minute can be critical to a site like a bank. To something else that gets five orders a day, but they're really important, one minute probably isn't going to be anything. Another thing your company has to determine, and that can be database by database, server by server, division by division, whatever. But RPO and RTO are the starting point from a management perspective of everything you decide about HADR and what your scenario is going to be to meet the goals of the company. All right, built into SQL Server, the very, very basics of uh, the, at the entry level of HADR is backup and restore. We all know about this one. Even non-DBAs understand what a backup and restore is. They may not know how to do them, but they understand what they are. Going up a step from that, and these are going to go from the most simple to the most complex. Uh, 
You have log shipping, which is essentially shipping your transaction logs, thus the name. From there, failover cluster instances, or uh, SQL Server failover cluster instances are starting to call them now, or maybe even always on FCIs. Just kind of depends on how old you are, how long you've been around, and who you want to talk to. Database mirroring, one database at a time, and it mirrors it. It's a very clever name because Microsoft continues the brilliant naming convention of making things very, very simple. Availability groups, very closely tied to the concepts behind database mirroring, but enhanced. It's they're basically database mirroring on steroids, and we'll get into that. Always on is not a thing. It's a marketing term. Don't use it anymore. Never, ever say always on again, DBAs. Say availability groups or say failover cluster instances, because both of those things are under the always on marketing term. So always on is just there to imply that it's always on, which of course is a bunch of nonsense. Nothing is always on. Replication. People use this term horribly wrong. They use it with instead of log shipping a lot. So if a customer calls me and says they want to set up replication, I ask them, what are they talking about? I ask them to explain it so I can figure out what they really mean. Replication is a SQL Server feature. It's tremendously valuable in some situations, but it's copying code and tables from one place to another, but it all has to be set up manually. If you add a new table, you have to go in and you have to add that manually. This is not an HA option. It is not a DR option. It's great for offloading some reporting work. It's great for uh, sales guys out in the field that go log on every night and upload their data. That's what it's designed for. It is not HADR. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise. All right. Going into these a little deeper. Backup and restore is DR only. You are never going to backup and have be able to restore in 30 seconds which to me 30 seconds is a good limit for an HA solution. It's great for DR, you know, if, if you've been backing up at the, at the right intervals to match your company's RPO and RTO, in, in this case RPO, uh, the, the data loss tolerance, then it may take five hours to restore that multi-terabyte database, but you didn't lose anything. So you've, you have the disaster recovery part covered, but five hour downtime, that's not HA. So, but pretty much everything starts here. So this is available in every edition of SQL Server. You can't automate it in every edition. Express, you can't. Web, I don't think you can, but I'm not going to look it up because I really only deal with Express Standard and Enterprise, and Express is 1% of the work I do. Standard and Enterprise, you can. it's the SQL agent. You can back it up. You can write some scripts. You can use some PowerShell. You can do whatever you want to do test restores. And like I said earlier, if you're not doing test restores of your backups, you're barely doing DBA work, right? And you're probably going to get blamed for something down the road. Uh, you cannot automate this in Express because there's no SQL Server agent in that version of SQL Server. Uh, backup in the store hasn't changed a whole lot in a very long time. There's a lot of code already written out there. Pretty much anything you can think you might want to do around backup and restore, somebody has already scripted it. And if you understand what's going on there, reuse those scripts. Don't go write your own unless you just have something really funky that you need to do. Step one in any HADR setup is going to be making sure you have backups. That should be true no matter what you're doing with SQL Server. Uh, different types of backups. You've got fulls. You may do differentials. You have to do fulls. You may or may not want to do differentials. Uh, largely, it depends on if you have disk space issues or if you have time constraints during the week or what have you. And you, if you're in full recovery model because you want point-in-time restorability, you need to do log backups, frequent log backups. That's your throughout all throughout the day type backup. Look all these things up if you don't know them. Or I've got other videos that cover uh, backup types and things like that. And backup restore is fairly cheap. Unless you're very, very constrained on hardware and storage, the nice thing is you can back up to a UNC path to a file uh, server, or you can back up into Azure. I've got a video on that as well. So there's no excuse to not be doing a proper backup scenario to protect your data. All right, log shipping is a disaster recovery option only. Log shipping is absolutely not high availability. Came with, it's glorified backup, copy, and restore. So you could have done this, and I did, in a place back in SQL 7 in 2000, just by writing a whole bunch of DOS stuff and calling that from a job. Uh, there's no automated failover or failback with log shipping, and that's why it's not an HA. If you want to fail over, that part is easy enough. You can go in and run a command on, on the the secondary server, and the database is online. 
but you're still going to have to point your applications to it. You're going to have to do a connection string uh, change or have something written that if the primary goes down, then it'll automatically repoint once the database is ready. That's not going to happen in 30 seconds. Uh, but it is a great disaster recovery option because those jobs that run this, um, by default, they run every 15 minutes. So at most, you're, you know, worst case scenario, you're 30 to 45 minutes behind. Typically, you're a lot closer. But it's a glorified backup copy and restore. It's just got jobs and alerts and, and a GUI to, to implement it. That's all it is. You've got one primary server throughout all the options in SQL Server. And none of them have more than one place that writes happen. A lot of them have a lot of places where reads can happen. Replication can do that. Again, not HADR. Um, AGs can do that. You can read from a lot of places and set different things up, but the writes always only happen on one server, and it is called a primary in this case. You can have more than one secondary server, which is fantastic. If you want to have one just for DR, and say you want to have another one where you're offloading reads for a reporting instance, there's two gotchas there. One, you got to license that instance, and two, you have to set it up to, when it does the log restores, you've got to set it up to have a delay and you've got to set up to where it's in read-only standby. So it's great if the people looking at your reports are okay with it being 2 hours or 12 hours behind. Say they only ever need to look at yesterday's completed data. That's fine. You just catch it all up at midnight, and then when they come in in the morning, yesterday's data is there, and you're not killing your OLTP box with a bunch of reporting work. So, definitely has its place. The jobs, like I said, they run every 15 minutes by default. Here's the big catch on this one. This is database level only. If you've got a, you know, 200 databases on your server, you're going to go through this setup 200 times. Anything such as jobs or logins, which are not stored at the database level, they're stored at the system database level, those don't log ship. So if you create a new login for a new team that needs access to such and such databases, you've got to create that on both ends manually. Same with any jobs or job changes has to be done, so you need to keep those kinds of things that are outside the user-level database synced up for this to be relevant in a DR scenario. Log shipping, basically the very simple version of this, and pardon my cheesy drawing because I did this in like four minutes. You've got two servers or two instances. Technically, for testing, you could do this on the same box with two installed instances. You would never do that in the real world for, for prod. You've got instance A and instance B. In the middle of them, you've got a file share somewhere. It could be local to one of those, but don't do that because if that server dies, so did your file share. So make it be out there somewhere independent of these two SQL Server instances. So you've got a file path out there that you reference. You're going to take a full backup one time from instance A of the specific database. You're going to run that. It's going to go to the UNC file path. And this is all doing, doing this in the wizard, which I highly recommend doing it that way because it's to me it's easier. And it's going to restore that full backup over on instance B. And then every 15 minutes, instance A is going to do a backup, a transaction log backup, to that UNC file path. Then instance B is going to run a copy job to move it from the file path down to its own local drives. And then it's got a third job that's going to do a restore. So your instance B copy of the database is going to be, by default, in a perpetual state of restoring. So every 15 minutes, it's going to be restoring, restoring, restoring. And in the most generic setup, what you're doing there is you've got a database that is always in restoring mode and you can't read it. If you flip the switch and click the right buttons, that instance B can be done in a standby mode where it's read only. And that's what I was talking about for your reporting instances. You can do that. It's not that difficult to do. But if you're in that mode, you don't want these 15-minute restores kicking everybody out every 15 minutes. So you want to have a delay on your restore jobs or have it only run every 6 or 12 hours. So it comes in, throws all the log restores on, and then it's clean for the next whatever interval you set. Totally dependent on your business needs. You may not even need this at all. So again, backup, copy the files, restore the files. It's really pretty simple and hasn't changed a lot since 2005. Uh, it's a lot like replication and, and uh, backup and restore. It just works. It, it works really, really well. Failover clustering, and be specific when you talk about this now, since the availability groups came in. This is the old school clustering that has been around uh, at least since SQL 7 that I know of, probably before. 
It's a high availability option. It is specifically designed for that and can save your bacon and be a DR as well. It, but it was designed so that you could, your outage min, uh, window would be minimal. It's not perfect, but I have seen many, many instances where the server died and it, well, the whole thing was back online in 30 seconds or less. You've got at least two Windows-based servers. Now, I know Linux came in with 2017, and I know there are clustering options in Linux. I just don't know what any of, any of them are, so we're going to talk about Windows only. So each of these servers is called a node. So your basic is a two-node cluster, and this is standard or enterprise. You can do a two-node in. Enterprise allows you four nodes, and my information on the number of nodes might be a little bit out of date. I haven't seen if they've changed it in 17 and 19 and whatnot. There's your nodes. You've got node 1 with SQL 1 on it. You've got node 2, which could have a second instance on it, and you could have two separate instances running on your basic two-node cluster. That's great. Um, there's some some gotchas around that on how you configure the memory and whatnot, but it is certainly possible. The, this used to be called an active-active cluster if you had SQL 1 and SQL 2. If you only have SQL 1, the new terminology is a single instance, and if you had both of them, it's a multi-instance, because you could have three or four or five. But we still, a lot of people say active-passive or active-active. It's fine. Everybody knows what you mean. So, and it's got a heartbeat connection that is going across a private network. Each one is checking to make sure the other one is there all the time. This is a little check that runs in the background. You don't have to do anything. If the check fails, and it fails enough times in, a, in the shor a short time frame, it's going to initiate a failover, and it's going to move that SQL 1 instance over to SQL 2. And the way I said that there, you purists that already know clustering, yes, that was not technically accurate, but we'll get into it a little bit here. In between these two, you have a SAN. And those of you who don't know what a SAN is, a giant box of hard drives. Storage Area Network is the acronym. Both instances, or both nodes, are connected to that SAN all the time. That's the shared storage in between, in between them. Only one node is running, say, the SQL 1 instance there at any time. You're never going to have SQL 1 active on both nodes. It can't do that. Because that would be, like I said earlier, that would be trying to write from two different servers to the same database, and it doesn't work like that. Single or multi-instance, we already covered. A lot of chief financial officers, when you convince them to go with this situation, are going to ask you, why did they just spend $30,000 on Node 2, and they're not using it, and nothing's going any faster? Hopefully, in that conversation, you have already explained to them, this is about saving the company and having the data available, not about performance. Performance is an entirely different concept and function of the DBA. So they get really upset when they have to, if you have one instance and you have two nodes, they've got a server literally sitting there doing nothing if you're lucky. But when you're unlucky and the first one dies, that second one kicks in, and that's when you go, ha-ha, Mr. CFO, guess what? That money we spent, we just saved a million dollars worth of lost sales today because you spent 20000 six months ago. That's how you win that argument when they get real upset about the money. All right, if you're going to have multi-instances, I already alluded to this, you need to size the memory properly per, per instance in case they all have to run on one node, and that's a big deal. Make a note of this diagram that while we have uh, node 1 and node 2, if one of those dies, the other one takes over, that SAN, that's where your actual database files, your MDF and LDF files, they live there. And you can't see this, of course, but I'm pointing right at it on the screen. Here, right here. If that SAN dies, for whatever reason, you're down. It's a single point of failure, and that is the big issue with failover clustering. Now, it's 2019. There are hardware vendors out there that have made such incredible strides forward in the last 15 years. There's an extremely low chance of that happening, but it still happens. So you have to be aware of it as an, as an up-and-coming DBA or, or sysadmin or whoever you are that you're actually watching this. So... Be careful on that. Don't let that bite you. Database mirroring. This is, it's a high availability or and or disaster recovery. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is a deprecated process. It came around, I want to say it was 2005, probably 2008. It was early. It was in that time frame. Uh, it is still available. It's deprecated doesn't necessarily mean Microsoft's going to take it out of the product. But it means they're not going to enhance it anymore, and they may not even support it after some point in time. So you may need to use this. I don't know that I would recommend it, but 
there's a, there's other ways to get good HADR stuff. There are there are two nodes, a principal and a mirror, are actually what they're called. You know, all these all these terms have different or all these different options of HADR have different terminology. You've got your your uh, primary and and secondary. You've got replicas over somewhere else. You've got this. You've got nodes. Principal and a mirror, thus the term database mirroring. If you want to have a certain setup, you'll need a third instance, and I believe this can be SQL Express, that ops, you know, acts as a witness. Because whenever there's two of something, and they're trying to make a decision on who's going to be the boss, you need a third person in there to break the tie. And that's what the witness is. And this is unlike log shipping, where you're doing 15 minutes worth of transactions that get backed up, copied, and restored. This is done transaction level. Now a transaction can be huge or it can be a one, you know, a delete of one row. So, you know, a transaction can have a lot of commands in it. So, but every transaction, say I insert a customer over on the principal very, very quickly, and we're talking milliseconds, that insert statement is replayed over at the mirror. So they're very, very close to exactly the same, as opposed to waiting for up to potentially 45 minutes with log shipping to, for all the backups and copies and restores to run. There are two ways you can set this up. Synchronous, and they call it high safety because synchronous means that the principal and the mirror are always synchronized. The problem with that is if your application doesn't insert at the principal, the insert has to succeed at the mirror as well before the application receives an acknowledgement that it committed the transaction. So there's a time delay in there to have it committed at that second box, the mirror. Asynchronous is the other side of that. Application submits an insert statement, it goes to the principal, and then the application gets an acknowledgement. As quickly as it can, the principal then sends that transaction over to the mirror for it to be committed there. So there's, there's the possibility if between, in asynchronous mode, between the application getting the acknowledgement and when the principal sends it to the mirror, if you have a, a problem right there, you could miss a transaction, or in a very, very high high transaction environment, you could miss a thousand transactions, or one really big one that had lots of stuff in it. So that's a balancing act that you have to do based on your company requirements. I can't tell you which is better because it depends. The magic DBA words, it depends. Automatic failover, and this is why it falls into the high availability, because synchronous for DR, automatic failover for high availability. You need the witness if you want this. But you can turn it on or off. You know, if the principal dies, bang, the mirror takes over. And there's there's some more switches and whatnot to it. But that's the high level stuff. And very much like log shipping, this is database level. So you need to keep your logins and your jobs and things that are not database level, user database level. You've got to keep those synchronized. That's on you. Write some scripts. Go find something from, oh, I don't know, but I bet dbatools.io probably has this covered already. So they've got everything else covered over there. All right. This is the new sexy. This came out, I think, originally in 2012. And like a lot of things, Microsoft, it was tough to work with. 2014 got a whole lot better. That's where my experience with it specifically got. An availability group can be much like database mirroring. Because earlier I said this is mirroring on steroids, and I wasn't wrong. It can be high availability. It can be DR, or it can be both. So it's similar to mirroring in theory, but here's the fun part. Multiple databases at once. But in order to get multiple databases, this requires Enterprise Edition. So it sounds like a fantastic solution. We should do this all over the place. If you have Standard Edition, it's not going to work. You need an Enterprise on both of the minimum of two machines. So it can get really expensive to do multiples of this, and you can expand availability groups beyond just two boxes as well. We're going to cover that. Bear with me. This does require a Windows server failover cluster, and I emphasize Windows. It is not a SQL failover cluster instance. So the SAN is gone. If you remember the box, the picture I had earlier with node 1, node 2 in the SAN, you don't need the SAN anymore. The architecture is completely different. But the Windows cluster service is still the one behind the scenes driving which node has control. And that's not the right terminology. Again, you purists, I know that. I'm trying to keep this simple for people that are new to the SQL Server HADR concepts. So it does require the cluster service. It doesn't require the SIN. 
because it's not a SQL Server failover cluster instances. You can have multiple secondary replicas. Depending on the version of SQL Server you have, the number of secondaries you can have and what they can do changes. The, the more recent it is, the more stuff you can do. So this is kind of similar to log shipping, barely, in that you could have a, a replica, a primary replica, um, a secondary, and another secondary. One of the secondaries does DR, and the other one does reporting. Um, and you can have them in different places as well. You can actually do distributed availability groups. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but you can look it up. Just That's the term, distributed availability groups. It's all over Google. So every instance of SQL Server participating in these availability groups are called replicas, even the primary, because each one of them has a copy of the data. If I have a four node or four boxes participating, in my availability groups, and I'm actually going to show you a picture here on the next slide of a five server or node setup, they're all replicas, no matter which one is serving which function at any given time. So just like that, you know, mirroring has principal and mirror, log shipping has primary and secondary, everything in availability groups is a replica. Okay, I've beaten that one to death. Just like all the others, all of your writes happen to the primary replica, regardless of which node it's running on. Again, they all have a copy of the data. The huge difference between this and a SQL failover cluster instance, because in that, there's one copy of the data and it's on the SAN. So this has gotten rid of the SAN being a single point of failure. You can set some of the replicas to be readable, so people can do reporting off of them. That's going to cost you money. Uh, some various things come with various versions of SQL Server. 2012 was quite a bit different from 2017. So you'll have to do your own homework on that one because I didn't want to look it up and memorize it. Because um, I always have to look it up myself. One of the kickers is that if you're going to set this up, if you've got your, your data and your logs on, on H and G, the replicas all need that same H and G path. So they need the same volume linters and the same file paths. So the databases can be set up and it, it's all the same across all the replicas. I was in a place that had four primaries on four different AGs, all pointing to the same physical box as a secondary. So we had to make sure all of them had different drive letters across the four. And then we had to have all eight of those drive letters on the, on that one replica. It was purely for, for reporting purposes. We'd never set it up for failover. So it was interesting because that's actually where I learned availability groups. You can set these up to auto or manual failover, synchronous and asynchronous. That part is just like the database mirroring. So that, that is a choice. All right, now here's the really pretty picture that I borrowed from Microsoft. Thank you, Microsoft. And if you work for Microsoft, no, this is a free video. You can't yell at me for stealing this image. And down there at the bottom, that link, if you want to go type all that into your browser, and I think you should, this is a beautiful screen. Hopefully, on your monitor, you're able to see in the middle where it has my AG availability groups, the colors behind those, the fill in colors. The first two are white. The second one is, or the third one is a blue fill. And the fourth and fifth are a kind of a yellowish background. If your screen's not that good, that may not come across very well. So I'll try to explain it as we go. All right. We see up here, and I'm going to draw on the screen with my mouse a little bit. I know that doesn't work really well for some people. This whole thing of all of these five nodes here, node one, two, three, four, five, these are all wrapped in the package of a Windows level cluster, a Windows server failover cluster. Again, different from a SQL cluster. So all of this is inside the same thing. So we have a one, two, three, four, five node cluster for the sole purpose of having this availability group. Right now, if this was a perfectly normal day at the office for this particular uh, AG, node 1 and node 2, they're all online, node 1 through 5. Node 1 is your primary, and node 2 is your secondary. This one, looking at the key down here, because these have a white background. Again, I'm over-explaining the colors for people whose screens aren't showing it properly, and I know that happens. These two are the synchronous commit with automatic failover. That means both of these have to commit the transaction before the application gets an acknowledgement back. So if node 1 dies, node 2 has all the data, and through some other stuff that goes on when you set this up, specifically called a listener, the application automatically starts talking to the secondary because it happened 
automatically and all the data was there. There's no data loss. So node one gets fixed and then you can optionally, you can move the, it becomes a secondary, node two becomes, is the primary. You can flip that back when it's convenient if you want to. All right. The, the, the blue one in the middle here, node three, is synchronous commit. So it is also getting all the data. So these three are actually involved as high availability. Every application, it has to commit here and here and here. Nodes one, two, and three. Every transaction that comes through before the application gets an acknowledgement that, the, that it has been committed properly. So, but if you lose nodes one and node two, notice this is blue and only manual failover. This one is not going to automatically pick up. You've got an outage here if you lose both nodes, nodes one and two. Three will not pick up. Your DBA is going to have to go in and do that manually. Hopefully he's sitting there bored looking at this one. If outage happens, more than likely he's at, you know, he's at dinner with his family and, or the other DBA, she's, you know, got to wake up at three o'clock in the morning. So you've already covered the one node dying. If two nodes die, which is exceptionally unusual, unless you have a problem at the data center or your rack is down, node three probably is never going to need to be the primary, but just in case. And then these other two over here, nodes four and five, they're asynchronous, so they're not going to slow down any uh, any transaction commits to the application. They're going to be there. Basically, they're only there for probably for reporting or for extra extra redundancy. I don't know why you would put a node four and five in this in this picture, except for making them readable secondaries, so you can do whatever you need to do. Now, this is this whole thing is assuming they're they're all on the same subnet and all that. The distributed availability groups I mentioned earlier. You can do multi subnet or geographically dispersed. Maybe they're in different data centers. Maybe they're just in different recs. Maybe they're, you know, who knows what they are. Um, again, all of this fancy stuff right here that costs you a bunch of money to put together is still only at the database level. So you now have to have five nodes that are all synchronizing logins and jobs. If you change the schedule on one job, that's got to be changed everywhere because you never know which one of these is going to wind up having to be the primary when you lose a node or two or three. Worst case, you lose four. Oh, number five over here, he can take over. But because he's an asynchronous commit, he might or might not have all the data if all four of these went goodbye. And you'd have to tell it and you'd have to force it to fail over to five. It's not going to do it on his own or four. It's the same thing. So what you're doing there when it says forced manual failover, that's you as a DBA saying yes, fail this availability group over to and you pick the node from a list and you understand that you might have some data loss because it's in asynchronous commit mode. I think I may have oversold it at this point. That's okay. I don't mind. That's all I've got for you. So please, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, go back to the title slide if you want to get in touch with me. Um, I don't do free private you know, email support. You can ask me questions on Twitter at Kevin3NF. You can find me on LinkedIn in various groups. You can comment on this video. There's a lot of ways. Anything you want to know, somebody else has that same question. I guarantee it. So go ahead and ask it in the comments or on uh, on Twitter. You can at me. And if you want, put in the, the hashtag uh, SQL help. And a whole bunch of really smart guys that are smarter than me are going to try and help you as well if you have a question about this. Now, if you need some private consulting, of course, that I'll, I'll do. And I'll charge, charge you for it, as will a whole bunch of other people. But if you just want to talk through this stuff and you've got an hour, you will you know, buy me for an hour, I'm happy to do that as well. All right, that's the end of my sales pitch. Have a great day.